diversification. I'm not sure. Is it about the diverse type of activities? Mm -hmm. If there is actually content that a person cannot find elsewhere, so kind of exclusive content that also keeps kind of motivating to go there and, and learn. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's about this balance between um, being serious about the content, but also having having some fun out there. Text not too long. Visuals. Design content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone would like to speak and uh, maybe comment on something you wrote? So you uh, you can enable your microphone or a video. Just uh, what is that here? Yeah, so we have things around the content. So if the content uh, is engaging and interesting and if it's exclusive, we have things around the uh, the how. So it's more the design, the videos, the good balance between fun and seriousness. Um, we have a bit of, on so that there is enough diversity or seeing that you make progress in learning. Um, it's also interesting to see now uh, how close it is actually to uh, non-online learning, to in-person learning, right? I think we would have this question for a, 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 any kind of learning. There would be many quite similar things there as well, right? I just keep wondering if it's really the same or is it um, something that we kind of uh, still speak for from being very familiar with the face-to-face -face environment, you know? So it's kind of that we expect the same things. I bet, I mean, some things are the same and we are the same people. So if you like things visual, then uh, you probably would want to like them in residential or face-to-face -face or online. Uh, but I think some of it is maybe more also the, f okay, the force of habit, I wonder. Okay, so thanks for, for the initial contributions. Uh, we will go on. And uh, here I will give word to, to Snezh a little bit to um, make certain distinctions distinction between different types of learning. And it's about also a bit of terminology that perhaps might be new for some of you. Uh, because uh, the way the course is designed, the way it goes, um, makes influence on engagement, but also and a kind of expectation towards how much people are expected to be engaged and involved in course activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks, Simon. Yeah, this is we were thinking whether to include this or not. Uh, so it's not. Yeah, we and finally we decided to do it. Uh, not uh, so we would have a little theoretical input, but really, as Lyman has said, it does have a difference uh, on when we speak about engagement, what type of course it is, yeah, and then what we can expect. I'm thinking that maybe we could have made a little PowerPoint here, but okay, uh, that's for the next time. So I try to make it short. Um, and also to acknowledge that probably a lot of you know this already. Yeah, so this is just kind of a short uh, summary. So the first thing is uh, to make a distinction, distinction is whether the course is uh, synchronous or asynchronous. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, it's that if it's synchronous, that means that the content that is being delivered or facilitated means that everyone needs to be online at the same time. Yeah. So, for example, a webinar, yeah? So this, what we are doing right now, is uh, synchronous online learning, yeah? We are all together here, 
um, there is some content being delivered and facilitated, there is a conversation going on, and, and yeah, that's it. Uh, it doesn't need to be video per se or a video conferencing. It can be let's all meet in the discussion groups at the same time in the forum. Yeah? But um, still, everyone needs to be there. And then there is asynchronous, where you basically, it's the opposite, no? You put the content, content is there, and the people then uh, take it when they when they need it or want it or they plan their week, yeah? Uh, so I think when Michelle was announcing the online course, for example, before, um, when we thought that we would still meet in Olu, it said, it will take you, I don't know, maybe, uh, what was it, two hours per day, yeah? And then it's up to you to choose which two hours you take for this, yeah? But you don't have to be there at whatever time is now, 12.34. Yeah? Both, of course, have their advantages, disadvantages. Maybe we talk about it later where we talk about tips or something from our experience and so on. But just to know that synchronous is generally uh, more difficult to organize because of people's availabilities, uh, but at the same time might have a little, uh, like a bigger impact on, uh, on, on, on engagement. Yeah? So, and of course, whenever you have two poles, then you have the combination. So, of course, you can make your online learning as a combination of synchronous and asynchronous uh, activities. Yeah? So this is one, and uh, thank you, Limonis, for putting it in the chat. Uh, then there are also, um, and some things are overlapping between these uh, divisions. You have paced and self-paced courses, yeah? Paced means that it's the facilitator or the course creator that decides when certain content will be, uh, will be delivered. That doesn't mean that it needs to be synchronous, that you need to be there at the same time, but let's say every week on Monday, the, um, the certain unit uh, is being revealed. And I think for those who were there on Wednesday when I shared experiences from uh, Yokomo or from the MOOC on uh, European Solidarity Core, um, there we, for example, had, uh, it was mostly self-paced, yeah? For example, in the MOOC, that we delivered all the units and then it was up to people which unit they want to tackle, at which point, in which order, um, and so on, yeah? But if it's paced, that means that, you know, this week we do this, on Wednesday we are going to have a webinar, on Thursday we are going to have discussion groups, you have a deadline on Saturday to deliver group work uh, and so on. Yeah. Again, that also has an impact on, uh, on engagement and how do we see the engagement. Um, and then uh, also similar, but still another division is whether the course is facilitated or it's standalone. Yeah. So what we are having right now, it's very much a very, very facilitated course. Uh, yeah, so you have facilitators all the time with video conferencing, also uh, checking whether you are in your small groups, taking reflections and so on. S uh, standalone is if you basically create a course and that's it. Yeah, so facilitation is maybe this more background facilitation that you influence it with the design, with the content, with the questions that you asked and so on, but it's really, uh, there are no facilitation there. Again, a uh, combination, of course, it's possible is that you can have a facilitated course for, uh, for some time and then you have it standalone. Like what we did, for example, with the MOOC on European Solidarity Core, there is a phase where the course is facilitated and then there is a phase where content is still there, but the facilitators are not uh, engaging so much. Yeah. So this is yet another division. These are kind of something to know when you think about which courses you will take yeah and all of them more or less are possible uh, with uh, uh, MOOCs but also smaller uh, courses although you know they would all have their preferences yeah so with uh, blended courses or, or smaller online courses you will mostly have more involvement uh, from the facilitators and in MOOCs less but uh, the combinations are possible yeah do we have maybe any questions or people that would like to share their experience or ask something about this um, these things Wow. You can take the mics. You can also type, of course. I see uh, two, three people typing, but you can feel free to take the mic. Ah, it's clear. Okay. Michelle? I think, uh, I don't know, maybe this is one word. Um... I think with online learning, the temptation is to look also a little bit about finances. And uh, so the temptation is, um, so why can't it be uh, self-paced uh, self and uh, standalone? And because we already invest, invest a lot in platform, in developing the courses, creating videos, and, uh, and maybe we, we cut down the facilitators. So my plan would be uh, to slow down here a little bit and really have a look also at your target group 
Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's maybe something different if you work with trainers and uh, and you offer uh, uh, a course to trainers or youth workers, you offer a course to mentors uh, or to young people. Uh, then the question of uh, facilitation comes uh, quite important, uh, and you you need to have a look. Yeah, so uh, so it's not this this kind of immediately to say okay. Um, yeah, uh, maybe we go this way or this way, but have a look at your target group and what kind of support do they need, and then kind of answer the question: how and um, how often, and uh, how much do you need to invest in into facilitation? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Michel. I think there is also one. Uh, Limanus is answering one question, and then Ada is asking something that I think I will pass to Limanus to answer. But I just wanted to give you another example to support what Michel was saying. I'm also for people who know me, they know, but uh, I'm very much into uh, board games and also educational game design. And we are really aspiring to create a board game that doesn't need facilitation. Yeah, so it's a standalone board game. And we are struggling a lot. And I'm, I have recently come to actually accept that that's okay. You know, so we leave uh, the standalone board games to commercial designers, but I think facilitation is something that we do well in our educational field, and it's something that really can support the learners. Yeah, and actually, when you create uh, standalone courses, you really need to juggle very well uh, what content can you offer, so you make sure that the support is not necessary. Yeah. So when I was giving you an example that we will try out with this voice guided facilitation, I would never ever try to do it in a standalone course. Yeah. So to have an activity where people are left on their own to do something without uh, the support. Yeah. But um, yeah, maybe more on on MOOCs. I think I pass it to you, Lyman. Yeah. Um, so I can answer Ada's. Uh, I think I answered already mm -hmm. Christine's question on. Um, was the difference between asynchronous courses and self-paced courses? Uh, and Ada is asking, uh, yeah, what did you address during the facilitated phase before making it available as a standalone? Um, uh, usually, usually the courses are either you know facilitated or, or totally self-paced. So I think um, still it's good to have certain certain level of of facilitation or rather would say moderation of especially when there are forums open for contributions it's sometimes just uh, helping people to understand what is actually the question or sometimes it's reminding people the so-called uh, netiquette so etiquette online um, like the basic rules that you have to be you know specific you you shouldn't be impolite to others or you should add uh, hyperlinks instead of uh, putting huge links. So there are certain netiquette aspects that sometimes requires to facilitators to intervene and remind people about us. Even though this is sometimes often written on the top of discussion, for example, or it's written in the introductory session. But if you make self-paced course, often people decide whatever they want to start, and then they would skip some intros and then move on directly into something and then they would miss few basics how to communicate online so i think sometimes it's uh, it's good to have maybe at the beginning like setting up the rules setting up the conditions explaining people technical part and then it it, it goes on yeah um so and then usually when it's like fully facilitated course, then we as facilitators, we are online, we are answering people's questions. We sometimes promoting the discussion, um, sometimes even opening a new discussion topic if we see something is emerging in one place. Yeah. Also, when it comes to uh, synchronous activities like webinars, then of course, facilitator roles is quite clear there. Mm. So, um, yeah, if talking more about um, massive open online courses, which often are based on asynchronous activities, meaning that you can take uh, course content at any time of the day, in a way. Um, you are not asked to join a webinar together. You're not asked to really be somewhere online at the same time. Uh, and it's done because uh, MOOCs deal with huge numbers of people, yeah, hundreds and thousands and sometimes a few thousand people. So when doing any synchronous activities, 
um, usually people feel, oh, I cannot make it, and then people drop out. Yeah, so it's a, a tricky thing to, to have too many synchronous activities because people feel like, oh, there is a pressure to be there, but I cannot make it. Yeah, so uh, actually one of the interesting things in terms of um, reducing dropout rates for the MOOCs, for the courses which involve many people, is sometimes not to over-engage people. Meaning that uh, the more we give assignments, the more we give deadlines, some people cannot make it for the deadline because of their work, studies, and so on, and then they drop out. Yeah. So if I say, oh, there is a, a webinar, and people feel like I cannot make it, and then they drop out again. So it's good to have this uh, kind of balance between the activities and so on. When we first launched MOOC on, on Canvas Network, people were giving us advices there, like, try not to have too many discussions. Like, give people a chance to really relax and consume the content, and then time to discuss. But if there is discussion after each video, it just could be too tiring for people to contribute a lot. So in that sense, it's good to, to have a balance of not really over-engaging, in a way. Uh, what we are uh, also here, you said, well, I'm engaging if the topic is for me, if it's interesting for me. But I think one of the tips is to have a very clear topic and very clearly communicate what is the course about. If people come there and it's something different than they expected, they drop out and they don't engage. Yeah? Another thing you touched upon already is design and quality of the content. Uh, and very often, actually, half of the whole course budget, or sometimes more, goes on the design production and video production because it's expensive. But actually, in this way, we can deliver quite a quality content that can be also reused outside of the course environment. So I think having good dynamics, having good quality, good music, and good production, it keeps people going and keeps people enjoying the content and, and willing to actually look for more. Um, now there are new tools appearing. For example, you watch the video and then you can stop at a certain moment and then you can leave your questions or you can leave reactions. Also, it's possible to add the video and then actually um, define when the video should stop and there is a question for reflection. So actually when we talk about the video content, there are more and more tools appearing that allow to present video not purely as, as one piece, but also to have mode for reflection. And this is, I think, very interesting, very interesting how this is all developing. Um, Another thing is we mentioned also meaningful tasks. So actually having tasks that make sense, that really leads people to learn something new. Yeah, and as people said, maybe not something super challenging, but still something doable that people can really do, even though non people are in very diverse environments and, and, and contexts. You know, like in MOOCs, we would have someone, you know, just next door, maybe from the same country I am from, but then we would have like plenty of people from the Caribbean, from uh, I don't know, from from somewhere South Asia, or, or and so on. So it's really very very global. And then we need to see how to make a task that it's kind of universal and, and doable. Uh, another aspect is to uh, possibility to give chance to get feedback from an expert or from other learners. And those who maybe tried few you saw there is possibility to like make assignment, uh, submit the assignment, and then the assignment is given to some learners, and then these learners can give feedback based on the guidelines. So often that keeps people really interested and excited, like, oh, what other people think about me. Sometimes I do it in a simple way. I say point, just uh, post your work that you did, and then inviting others to feedback. And then I, as facilitator, I take this role to feedback first, and then other people can add. Being responsive very quickly to people's questions. If it's facilitated course, then the quicker the better, especially when it comes to technical um, 
the technical aspects of the course. Um, uh, I think regular announcements, we clearly, because we can see all the statistics in the course, that uh, announcements remind people that something is happening there. And then whenever there is an announcement, we we'll always see a peak in participation. So people come back to the course, they do a few things, and maybe again, they forget that they are in this course. So regular announcements and some interesting data, some interesting statistics, maybe some quotations, it helps people to be uh, engaged and to remember that they're actually <laughs> taking part in the course. And uh, another aspect was mentioned to establish patterns. Um, sometimes it may sound strange, but you know, people need some kind of safety net. People don't want that every day they open new content and it looks different, different colors, different, very different exercises each time. So um, you can find quite a lot in terms of uh, you know some literature and advice is that it's good when there are certain patterns. Yeah. So for example, we would have a module, and then each module would have let's say two videos, a um, couple of exercises, one discussion, and the quiz at the end. Let's say. Yeah. And then if the course content is somehow similar, then it's good to to keep some pattern what people may expect. Yeah. It's not necessarily the same exercises, but some kind of pattern is good. Yeah? Uh, talking about recognition, if one module is ending with the um, information about what badge you can get from this module, it's good to have this integrated in every module. Yeah? Or not to have one module with five discussions and then another module only one discussion. So more seeing how you can really have it as a system in your in your course and not to have totally wild and crazy modules differing a lot from each other so these are the few few things that i came up for i think reflecting um reflecting my my previous experience before uh, facilitating MOOCs and if there would be some questions feel free actually to to ask them now Sabrina is typing. Ah. I'm wondering how many people did we lose for the sing-along? Are they still singing? I think so. <laughs> Eta is typing. We allow the discussion mode, no? Yes, it is. You can also speak people I'm with sorry. you. Want. <laughs> um, maybe I will ask. I mean, uh, I'm not sure really if uh, you can uh, reply because I think it changes from case to case. But I'm also considering how much time investment I can expect from a certain participant over a certain time because I guess it will also influence many of my decisions. Um, I, I guess there's a, a bit of common sense there. I don't know, a few hours per week and not more than that, but um, I wonder yeah. if you have some insight to that. Yeah, I think from last five editions of uh, Erasmus Plus MOOC um, um, and where we collected information from like more than 6,000 people, I think, uh, the most common answer is that people are okay to dedicate between two and four hours a week. Which means that people maybe would do half an hour every day or they may do two hours somewhere Friday evening. Um, that's usually what is okay for people. And if, if learning requires more than that, it's kind of difficult because people usually take online courses as extra on top of what they do already. Okay, if no more questions, I think we can, yeah? Someone yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering if there is a document or something uh, with the with the tools that you're speaking about, for example, this video thing, if you would be able to share any resources or links or something like this. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, I'll probably uh, check with uh, with Tomek and Mikhail what is the space that you have there on the course. Um, so if there is some space on the different tools that are possible to integrate, maybe there. Hmm. So we can share, yeah? Great. Hmm. Good. Also, it, you know, very much depends on the on platforms, you know. There are some tools that work for one platform, other tools that work for the other platform. So it's it depends how how well they can be integrated in, in different platforms as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So shall I share a, a few things about the? Uh -huh, wait, Michel. Uh, so maybe one one idea because I like like this point. Uh, do not over engage people. And um, and I think um, I'm I'm also as a as an as a I don't know facilitator I'm uh, I'm a bit trapped because I'm excited about my own course and um, I want to do a lot and um, and I have um, to to come down to another but maybe something something also I would maybe recommend is uh, to give rather maybe a small task. And but then maybe uh, I, I don't know a follow up or something. So for those who would like to invest a little bit more or go deeper, you can do still this and this. Yeah, but uh, divide a little bit is kind of um, okay. Some small, and if if they are into it uh, and they are excited, then can go more. But if they say, oh no, oh, now my my limit is reached, uh, so I stay with this. But they're happy to to have realized also the the small small task mm. hmm. yeah i think this is also an example of this uh, a little bit of a paste and self-paced yeah that you also leave freedom for people then to dive deeper and so on but there are still things that they need to do as part of the course okay uh, i think i will just share a few things also about the blended perspective although some of the things overlap of course it's still the the online environment uh, and i think just to maybe start by saying that um, I really want to highlight this, that we need to understand uh, also how we assess the engagement uh, of people. Yeah, And then uh, we also had a discussion about it the other day. And it's uh, the thing is that online, you really see when the person logs in, you really see when the person leaves or writes something in a discussion forum, whereas in the residential room, we don't do this assessment so strictly. Yeah? So I think we tend to panic online if people didn't do this or didn't contribute like this. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it's okay. And then also to have in mind these different types of learners that we have and also some people that simply would take something and not something else. Yeah. So I think it's one thing is not to overdo with engagement. Uh, but I think another thing is also not to panic when we feel that there is no engagement. That said, of course, if you know, if two thirds of your participants are not appearing, then it might be time to um, to think about these things. Yeah. But I think also to, to see how we assess these things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think one thing just to want to echo, I think Lyman has already said, is this thing about the design and setting up the things to be as easy for participants and learners as possible. Um, and uh, and I think that's super important. Yeah, if people would need to click around every time they want to do something, we, we would lose them very easily. Yeah? So if they find it challenging, if they find it difficult, then many people would simply just not do it, yeah, because it's not inviting, it's not engaging, yeah. So when we are setting up activities, I think it's very important to see that um, they don't need to click around one million times, and then and maybe then this familiarity uh, pattern helps as well, yeah. So I think we mentioned this in the previous session. Uh, I think um, or even before, start with a page and then go to the book, yeah. If you use uh, Hop, yeah, and uh, so people get used to one thing, and maybe you use it several times, and then you try out with uh, something more complex uh, because that will be easier for them, easier to engage. I think with blended courses, a little bit is the same with MOOCs or the rather smaller courses, is to be present because I think. Um, I also notice with myself and the colleagues, we do something and we give tasks to people and then we disappear. Yeah. So, for example, you ask a question or you ask people to do a little task, uh, introduce themselves and then we ourselves don't do it. Yeah. So I think a little bit like we participate in welcome evening, you know, and in the group building, not group building, but getting to know activities. I think it's also nice that we are present at the beginning as well. So people see us and they understand that we are there. Yeah. Otherwise, they might feel that they are left alone. So I think um, it's recommended to make your, pro you know, if you ask them to make their profile and answer some questions, I think it's nice if we also make our own profile and uh, answer the same questions so people know who we are. Yeah. The trust does not come. I think uh, uh, it's not given, yeah? 
Um, I think uh, what is important, and I think some people said in the quality, is that how to write instructions or in general how to write. Uh, I, of course, we could have a separate course on this, but I think it's very important to know that when we give instructions online, um, there is not, not so much chance to clarify. Yeah, uh, not many people would send a message and say, what exactly did you mean here? Yeah, so if it's not clear, okay, if there is a little thing, they might come back. But if it's not clear at the beginning, you would, again, probably lose people. So I noticed that when I do courses, regardless of whether it's a MOOC or a, or a smaller or a blended, I spend so much time reading and reading whether my instructions are clear, whether each point is well uh, covered and so on, so people don't get lost. Yeah? So think about this, yeah? Whereas in a plenary, they will easily ask you, hey, um, you know, what did you mean by this? Uh, in the online instructions, probably people will not ask the, the question there. Yeah? Um, it's also about the, the questions. Uh, I think it's also to, you know, like as facilitators of learning, we know that it's super important to ask the right questions. And that is even more so important in the online. Again, there is no chance for clarifying. So really a clear question, not 10 questions in one, which maybe some of us uh, tend to do. Yeah. So if it's a question that it's a single question and then there is an answer, yeah, not a bulk uh, somehow there. And also not to overdo with questions. I think maybe that's something that I think it's also basic, uh, basic, uh, how to say a tip for facilitation in general. It's not to, you know, ask people five questions and they're like, okay, and, and then people don't know what to answer. Yeah. But really try to be carefully choosing your questions and then really to, to get the answers that you, you want, I think. Um, yeah. What else did I, did I have? Uh, I had a few things. I think one, another thing is about discussions. Um, even if it's a larger course, try to be present in the discussions, uh, even if you feel it. And I think there are some things there, but to stimulate people to respond, it's nice to have facilitators present. I think what I noticed is that um, what people would do, they see it as a task. So if you have something, people will come, they will put their reply and that's it. Yeah, They will probably not kind of reply on reply and check. But if we as facilitators maybe make this incentive and we reply and then you even invite people to, to clarify, you know, or invite others to join in, it doesn't always work. Still, many people will not come back, but it will work. Um, it will work for some. Yeah. Are you still with me? It's really weird not to have this. Um, okay, some people typing. Very good. I only have a few more things and then we will check if there are, if there are questions. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one thing uh, it's that I think to be to try to think of different stimuli uh, because like in face to face, not everyone is a reader, not everyone likes to watch videos, not everyone likes to discuss. So to try to combine, but keeping in mind what Limonas was saying, not to have twenty different activities in one unit. You know, here is a bit of video, and here is a bit of a page, and here is a discussion, and then here is a task for you, and so on. Try to diversify, uh, but also not, over, not overdo it, I think. Uh, but it's, again, another one of the, I think, of the non-formal education as well. Yeah, Because uh, although it's online learning, again, still not everyone learns in the same way. Yeah, So it's good to, maybe for some people, I, for example, something that I was not doing uh, was to include resources for people to read. Because I was thinking, if there is a video, if there was a bit of instructions, but people like to dig. So it's it's very nice to actually give resources to people so they would dig more and get more uh, more interested. Um, and maybe um, uh, one last point is, uh, or two last points actually. Uh, one thing is about the groups. Um, it's nice to use groups. Uh, Moodle allows it, uh, but of course the people need to be prepared for the groups. Yeah? So you cannot just start your course and send people into groups because they would find it awkward and probably will not engage. So they also need to get to know each other a little bit and maybe have some synchronous activity like a webinar or something where they see each other and then they're able to uh, to do the, the group together. Yeah. And then what I found also, but it also takes time to warm up. So if you have a longer course, is the tasks. Yeah. So if it's something that people can do with uh, in the community or something that they can uh, uh, include or post later. Or I wanted to share with you one task that I had as a learner, which is when we were given uh, a footage. It was about uh, different narratives and the bias and so on, given different footage where people were asked to make a video of five minutes based on this different footage. And then we shared with other people. Yeah. So these kind of tasks when you need to do something, but still you share with others and they see your perspective are often working quite well um, online. Because my feeling is that what people appreciate is when they see a little bit of what people are bringing with them yeah, from their local community, from their organization, from their practice. I think sharing practice is often quite, uh, quite nice and engaging yeah so these are just some of the things um 
that I had in mind. It's good that uh, some people are alive. Marcus is sharing. So now if you have any questions um, or any other things that you would like to know about engaging learners, we have a few more minutes, maybe. Or not. <laughs> No questions. There was topic of recognition um, added to this session. So I wonder if we should still just share a few things here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marcus, Marcus. what to yeah yeah I think Mike is still possible yeah 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 should quicker be. as well probably yeah exactly mm -hmm. thank you so much no I totally agree with all the things you said and it's a nice confirmation of the of the principles we also follow from the Dawa course and as as just something to add in case the course is complex and has several modules and in case you're several people developing it what we did in our team is to first agree on some basic guidelines. For instance, how we address learners, yeah, the style, how we address them, to have everything coherent afterwards, the terminology, the length of texts. So we agreed on certain guidelines, and then we made a template. We designed together one module that would serve as a template. We said, yeah, this, this looks good. Then people could develop their different modules and different topics. And still, there was one person in charge afterwards to make sure everything is coherent in terms of style, in terms of effort, in terms of engagement, et cetera. So just as a way to not to lose time when you produce a, an online course in a team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for yeah. adding, Marcus. Mm. Very much agree on that. And that is why often we at first have um, most of the things like in the Google document, so we can easily see all the content in one place and then check the style and everything and then, yeah. you know, move that content to the course environment mm. and and i agree that these even small details like how do we approach people how much text we write it's it's good to double check that because everyone have their own style of expressing themselves and and usually it comes just by trying and seeing how different or how similar it is um, and then agreeing on, on, on kind of basic principles. Also announcements. Is announcement really huge text? Or is it more visual? Is it with some pictures? I know some, some facilitators do video announcements, so they film themselves somewhere in the field and they, they talk rather than write long text. So it's also something to agree in the team. Mm. So I don't know if there is still some time to to to, to few things on on recognition. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe one comment on readability. So mm -hmm. if you look, for example, at different uh, texts uh, in internet, so I think you will get a feeling um, what is nice to read and what is difficult to read. So if we have a paper which is published for, I don't know, a kind of um, scientific uh, database, you have a lot of text, no illustrations, and uh, it's a uh, huge paragraphs and long sentences. But if you go for blog posts, for example, like, like bloggers, they write totally differently. Yeah, They have really kind of short sentences, three, four sentences max, then there is a paragraph uh, and then there is coming the next four, yeah. So and and some illustrations then then in between. So it's just kind of um, get maybe a feeling what is for you also easy to read in internet, and then also in that way try to to use it as a kind of a template which you have for for your own uh, text uh, if you want to deliver some content. Yeah. And if you if you search if you if you Google about readability, uh, you will you will find a lot of different advices out there um, how to increase readability in terms of the length of sentences, 
And now we have tools like uh, Grammarly, where you actually put your text in there, and Grammarly is analyzing the, the, and gives you score of readability, and it also uh, it gives you analysis of how old people should be and what should be their English level in order to understand your text very well. So that helps me a lot just to double check and actually it says whether the sentences are not too long, whether I'm not using too complicated words, um, That that's really helpful too. It's also about the fonts, not to make fonts too small, not to make very light gray letters on the on the gray background because some people may have difficulties with the bad contrast which is just like putting people off from reading anything yeah mm -hmm. okay so maybe Lyman has a few sentences i think we are already over time so something about recognition and then we wrap up slowly yeah so or quickly yeah just a few things on on recognition um i believe every team is making their own uh choices uh when it comes to courses that were so far under erasmus plus program uh we always want to issue youth pass as, as kind of official tool for recognizing learning in this program um so then uh usually we put um youth pass as recognition tool and then you can set up uh, when it's unlocked. So for example, you can put criteria that if people completed uh, certain certain sessions, certain modules, then they have, they have access to the youth pass. And then we add a survey where people add their name, surname, uh, email address. And then we all often also add um, some questions just to get feedback from participants. So this allows to collect data and then generate youth pass. Um, unfortunately, still people cannot claim youth pass themselves. So it's really like you need to do everything manually and then send each youth pass by email to each participant. And hopefully these, these functions will change somewhere in the future. Uh, but then uh, often we use uh, open badges in online courses because then you can easily set up uh, open uh, badge for each module and then you set up the criteria uh, what people need to do in order to get the open badge and it's issued often automatically if they complete or if they view all this all the sessions within one module so you can set up your own text you can set up the criteria and then you can also see the report of how many people uh, got uh, badges and then we often add a spe special section for people to understand what open badges are and uh, um, how to share badges elsewhere and uh, how does that work in the course environment so we often also combine both you get badge for every module and then you get youth pass based on the criteria that your team is deciding and now I think for one course, we just decided like, okay, because it's a self-paced course, we don't want to limit people. We say whatever people finished, whatever people completed, they just write it down in the short survey, what modules did they complete and they have access to, to Youth Pass, even if they did just one module. Because for us, it's also about just giving recognition to this non-formal learning online and, and not to limit too much and not to put too many conditions to recognize learning. Because if people just did one module, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's what they needed. And it's okay also to give recognition for that. So these are my few thoughts, and I, I already see that people need to leave, so I think it's fair enough not to prolong too much and then finalize that session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think this is what we had uh, for today. Um, it's recorded. For example, Sami couldn't uh, join. So for those who would want to watch it uh, afterwards, it will be there. Um, so thank you for being us with us. And uh, thank you for staying at home. That's also important these days. Um, and I think Tomek would like to say something.